Our topic today is active studio monitors and whether or not they work well for high-end audio. We have moved locations again. This is one of our programming offices and our lead programmer is a, a young lady uh, named Tierra Yulberg and Tierra, who's not here right now, this is her, 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 her space, um, she, she's a wonderful lady. She is actually the captain of the United States underwater hockey team. Oh, no, hockey, underwater hockey. And um, for, for those of you in the know, this is a, a P20, one of our new power plants. You can see it on the front. And so in, in, in programming, what, what Tierra and some of our other programmers do is they work uh, sometimes on making the machines do what the machines do because all of our modern stuff, with few exceptions, are run uh, with microprocessors, at least for the front panels. But there's also the area of GUI, and GUI stands for Graphical User Interface, G-U-I, and it's how we interact with our machines. If you're, well, if you're looking at an iPhone right now, there's a, that's almost all GUI, right? I mean, it's, everything is the touch screen and whatnot. So on the front of our devices, we have touch screens, and um, if, you, if you touch it, you can do something. I don't know what this thing is set up to do. Maybe that's not even going. I don't know what it's going. But here, just in case you've never seen one, I don't want to wreck this thing because this is a, but here, this is, <clears throat> this little guy is the, I don't know if you can see that, this button here. Oh, this thing is a beast. There goes poor nipper. Uh, anyway, we have a front panel logo button and that's what this is. And if you were to press that. And then this is um, the GUI and you can see that's the board that makes it work. There's all the chips and stuff that support the display and let's see. Oh, that one works. But I don't know what all this is. 99, 88, 77. So I don't, it's, this is some kind of programming thing which I probably shouldn't be messing with. Sorry, Tierra, if I come in and it's all screwed up. But anyway, that, that's where we're at. And um, our question today, more to the point, comes from Tattoo in Helsinki, Finland. Hi, from Northern Europe, Finland. And his question is, um, I would be interested to hear what your take is on professional active studio monitors, especially the big ones like the Genelec 1236A and, and uh, units like that. I'm, I'm doing a little interpreting here, sorry. Um, do they qualify as high-end in your book or are they just tools for professionals for mixing and mastering? And this also relates to your previous video as this type of speakers are often placed in walls in studios. Best regards. Tattoo. So, not many people use Genelex and active speakers for their high-end audio systems. And there's probably a good number of reasons why that, that is true. Um, I, I'm not particularly a fan of their sound. They are rather specific to the recording industry, and I, I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you if, if, uh, well, I'll tell you two quick little funny stories. Keith Johnson, who is the chief recording engineer and a brilliant guy at Reference Recordings, and he's made some of the the greatest recordings ever. If you if if you want true reference material to hear what great live recordings can sound like buy a reference recording. I've got every single one they've ever made and they are stunning. The, the Rudder Requiem is one of my all-time favorites, one of the ones that I use. When people come here to listen to the IRS 5 and, and the PS Audio equipment and I want to have them like, holy shit, listen to that. When, when that happens, I put on the Rudder Requiem. And there you've got a pipe organ, you've got a huge 200-piece choir, 150, whatever, um, and a, uh, you know, a 
a couple of instruments. It's just a magnificent recording. And that's all the work of Keith Johnson. They used to call him Professor Johnson, Dr. Johnson. And uh, I've known Keith for oh, hundreds of years, uh, uh, you know, when we were both uh, just getting started out. And one of the things that surprised me um, was what Keith used for loudspeakers. I, I imagined at the time, because his recordings, which work on high-end audio systems so well, I imagined that he must have had something really great. You know, what was it he used to get that sound on my system? He used a pair of his own speakers that, frankly, he said, if you listen to the, those in your living room, you'd probably be horrified. They, they don't image, they don't do anything that a high-end audio speaker does. And they do what he needed them to do, which for his skill level, I, I mean, I can't repeat and I can't tell you what it is Keith Johnson needed it to do, but I can tell you that it did whatever he needed to make those recordings the way he wanted so that when I listen to him and when you listen to him on your systems, they sound great. Um, the speakers he used, not so great, not for the home audio. In fact, Keith doesn't listen to those speakers when he takes it home to audition it. He's got a regular pair of loudspeakers, which uh, I, I don't know now. I know a lot of, uh, he also is involved with Spectral, and the Spectral guys, I know they like, um, uh, who's, uh, oh, Bruce, uh, MIT cables for a while, and then I think it was Transparent. They're, and spectral amps, and then um, Magico. I, I heard a, a, a properly set up spectral approved system playing reference recordings when I was in Japan, and that's, that's kind of what they use. That was sort of that, that group of people that uses that. But in any case, it makes the point that speakers specifically designed for recording studios are not necessarily, and in fact, Probably not what you want to use for a high-end audio system. Anyway, there's a bit of insight for you. I, I appreciate you watching and asking those questions. Thank you. Bye.